Hey, small business people and lovers of good stories in general. Welcome to episode 43 of Small Business War Stories. In this episode, we go deep, deep into the heart of the Mississippi Delta in Clarksdale, Mississippi, and we sit down with Robin Colonus of the Roxy Theater. And Robin's a really, really interesting, fascinating woman. She is a sailor, and she also is passionate about uh, music and the arts and about the Delta. So she is leading the revitalization of the Roxy Theater and to uh, turn it into a positive influence in, in the Clarksdale community. And I don't want to steal her thunder. She has a lot of really, really cool stories. But this is a great episode that took place actually there in the Roxy Theater as they were preparing for an upcoming festival. This episode was a part of the Soul of America tour. And as part of the Soul of America tour, it's brought to you by Tacovas Boots. Tacovas is their handmade boots. And if you're tired of paying 700 bucks for boots, you can get Tacovas Boots for a fraction of the price because they don't go through dealers. They go directly to you. You should check them out. I wore them every day of the Soul of America tour. I got a lot of compliments. They're very, very good looking, very comfortable. And you can check them out at Tecovas, T-E-C-O-V-A-S, boots.com. The episode is also brought to you by Impact Crates. They're dog safety crates. My puppy Muddy Waggers traveled in one every single day of the Soul of America tour. And they are amazing. They're made out of aluminum. They're very, very easy to transport. They fold. And you, your puppy will be safe. You can check them out at Impact Crates. And if you use code MUDDY20, M-U-D-D-Y-2-0, you'll get 20% off your Impact Crate. The episode is also brought to you by Badger Mapping. And Badger Mapping is a mapping company that allows you to map out your route. If you're a salesperson, you can figure out how to go from you know one appointment to the next and what the most efficient way is to map out your uh, your travels. So check out Badger Mapping. And Badger Mapping, if you tell them you found them in Small Business War Stories, they will give you two free months. And every episode of the Soul of America Tour and every episode of Small Business War Stories is brought to you by Proven. And Proven.com is the company I started with my business partner, Sean, and it is a small business hiring tool. So it's designed exclusively for small businesses and and with small businesses in mind. It's very simple and easy to use. You can post your job. We have hundreds of different job board partners distribute your job widely. You get all the applicants in one place. You can collaborate with other people on your team. And we have really, really simple, easy to use interfaces on our app and on your phone, and you can use it on your computer as well. There is a free trial, so you can check it out. Go to proven.com and we'll make your next hire a lot easier so you can get back to doing what you love. Without further ado, I want to get into episode 43 of Small Business War Stories with Robin Colonus of the Roxy Theater in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Small Business War Stories. Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes. And we are live here in Clarksdale, Mississippi, in the Mississippi Delta. And I have the pleasure to sit down today with Robin Colonas of the new Roxy Theater in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's really cool to have you here. So I've been here before uh, during one of my visits to, uh, to Mississippi uh, to play a little blues. And it's really cool to get to sit down uh, with you to hear a little bit more about the, the story. I mean, you can feel the history in the walls here. Yes, definitely. There's a lot of history. I'm glad to know that you have been here before. It's kind of hard to explain to people that aren't here what it is that we have gone. We are going to try our best. <laughs> so um, maybe tell me a little bit about the new Roxy and, and what, what it was and what it is today. Okay. Um, the new Roxy was built in the late 1940s. Um, it was built as a movie theater. It was the second, uh, it was the expansion of a theater that was originally physically right next door to it. Um, town was booming then and they expanded, built this theater specifically. Um, it was a segregated movie theater. Um, and 
Muddy Waters played the grand opening, they say, back in the wow. day. And um, so I it's t- good to have Muddy Waggers, the dog yes, named Muddy after Waggers is Muddy Waters. <laughs> very appropriate. <laughs> very cool. Um, it, it was always a movie theater. It wasn't a, a music venue. Okay. Uh, Ike Turner worked here selling popcorn as a teenager wow. in the concessions. So there's some music history here just because it's Clarksdale and yeah. there's music history everywhere. Um, but um, it's located in the historic part of town called the New World District. Um, it functioned as a movie theater until the early 80s. Okay. Um, in the early 80s, I think, is the last time that it showed films. And then it essentially sat vacant for 30 years before I um, purchased the property in 2008. 2008. Mm-hmm. So I have to ask, I mean, uh, we'll get into, into the history of the town of Clarks a little bit, in, in a little bit uh, in, in, because it's a fascinating history that's... Uh, you know, really soaked in, in you know, blues history uh, and, and also I, I'm interested to, to hear what you think about it going forward. But what in God's name inspired you to purchase a an old theater, which I presume at that point wasn't that safe to enter uh, in 2008? Um, it's kind of a little bit of a journey how I ended up at that point, but um, the the quick short version is is that I came to Mississippi as a blues tourist in 2002, okay. um, bought the guidebook, blues sites, and specifically took a job in the New Orleans area so I would have the weekends off to travel and explore the, mu- the music scene. Nice. And so um, that brought me to Clarksdale amongst many other cities and for some reason Clarksdale just really grabbed onto me and I started returning vacationing in Mississippi and in 2005 I purchased the building across the street from the New Roxy okay and um, was working on that it was um, spending time here I really appreciated the history and what was going on here and just saw so many buildings falling down simply from neglect they yep. they were possessed by people but um they'd been empty for years or wasn't um they were possessed only by spirits yes <laughs> <laughs> um so i i pers- very full full heartedly um without much of a plan purchased the building across the street thinking that i would at least try to be able to protect it um and then a couple of years later i ended up the new Roxy became available for sale. It was across the street and it definitely has a a very amazing energy and the ability for the space to be used right away. Um, It it comes for those people that are not familiar. It's basically a a brick shell, a rectangular brick shell with a sloping concrete floor and a large masonry stage in the front. And no roof on the... um, Yes, and there's there's no roof over part of it. When I bought it, the roof was still intact, but badly damaged. It was falling in and hanging from the roof joist. So um, we spent the first couple of years literally pulling the debris off of the roof and hauling it all out by hand and um, then trying to figure out how we put it back together again. Wow. So what, it just had this romance to you that you wanted to, What I mean, what, what was the, did, did you pause at any point and be like, whoa, should I really do this? <laughs> um, yes, I paused it at many points. Um, and again, it's long convoluted story. I initially purchased the new Roxy with a business partner. Um, and, and that, I ended up being the sole owner um, yeah. after a short time. So I really wasn't sure, but we just kind of organically kept working. I would come to town for a festival and I would stay for six weeks and I would just shovel dirt and haul wood. And uh, So when you first bought it, you weren't living here in Clarksdale? No. Do you no. live here now or not? Um, yes. I'm okay. originally from Seattle. Okay. And um, my job, my, my real job is as a merchant mariner. So okay. um, I spend a lot of my time away at sea. But the time off allows me to sort of live or vacation wherever I choose. Okay. So um, it, it took me 10 years to sort of make the, so the this, shift. This story gets better and better. A true <laughs> sailor buying an yes. old theater no, and actually... turning it into a blues venue. I mean, God, I can't, I can't even make this stuff up. It's. Um, it, from from a sailor's perspective, it's kind of cliche. It's like you know, yeah. buy a bar and retire. I, I from am going a little disappointed <laughs> by the lack of full tattoos. But. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, you have the chicken. Yes, I have the chicken. And the goat. You have the goat. Uh, it's a pig. Oh, it's pig. A pig. Sorry, pig, pig, pig and a pig. chicken are the two. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I have the chicken, but no, no, no pig, pig yet. Okay. Got it. <laughs> but, wow, yeah, but I've got an anchor and a propeller and a ship's wheel and all the other. Uh, Makes <laughs> sense. Wow. Okay. 
This is this is wild. I have so many questions. So when you bought it, you knew that you wanted to do a music venue. No, no, absolutely not. Okay. Um, so full disclosure here, I guess we didn't discuss in the beginning. Um, I didn't consider this a business venture, and at this point, it's still, I kind of refer to it as my very expensive hobby. Wow. Um, I, I, I possessed the buildings and purchased the buildings with the intent of saving the buildings, but not with a solid plan of, of how I was gonna do that. And I was very adamant in the beginning that I didn't want to, to wasn't gonna open a blues club. I didn't want to have a music venue for, yeah. for a lot of reasons. Um, I, because of what I do, I'm gone and I can't commit to something being open all of the time. Sure. And it's also sort of, you know, everybody comes into town and wants to open their own joint. And I did, just didn't feel like I could bring to the table something that would feel authentic yeah. here. Um, when I did purchase the new Roxy in the theater space, I looked at it as a, I really wanted it to be returned as something in the community. It was a very important structure in the community socially, and, and I wanted it to be that way again, and not necessarily just for music. I wanted it to be for theater or film and movies again, or um, whatever the space can be utilized for and used by the community. Okay, okay, and wh how did it how did that evolve? Because today, I mean, right now, you're kind enough to share your time in the middle of heavy, heavy preparations for the impending Juke Joint Festival. <laughs> yes. Which is this weekend, right? Um, it's not this weekend. The following weekend. It's the following weekend. Okay. Um, and But we will start, we'll have five days of music next week. So next Tuesday, it kind of starts okay. for so us So you next are Tuesday. kind of a music venue. Now, we, but, we you, but you also do other stuff, We are a music right? venue. And it kind of just, it, it evolved into that because we naturally have a stage. We naturally have a lot of musicians here. Yeah. And so definitely we, we and I'm a music lover. So we have live music. Um, but I don't want it to be just what we do. Yeah. I, it's not my intention for this to ever be a, a spot that's a bar that's open every night with music. So you're not um, open every night? No, we are um, a seasonal venue um, or a venue for hire. Yeah. Um, traditionally, over the years, I would come in the spring during Jute Joint Festival, okay. and then I would come again in the fall. Um, we don't have climate control right now. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's, this... it's, it's, it's the Lord's climate control. <laughs> <laughs> it comes straight through. The... So those are the better seasons to be open and um, yeah. be able to um, plan something. As we've undergone renovation, we've added this front space where we have roof and this will be eventually climate controlled here okay but um so you know each year over so how many days are you open in average year? um i would say at this juncture less than 30. okay um but each year it grows you okay. know the first years i was you know open two days a year okay and then you know the next year it wow. was kind of a big deal to to be open to the public four days of the year yeah. and in the beginning we had no roof at all there was you know but not time, even here no this is this is all brand new all okay. all of this roofing is brand so we, new so just so our audience knows we are here in an upstairs area of like the inside stage which would have been the lobby of the theater yeah, at one point. Yeah, it's basically the front lobby of the theater yeah, when and you then, first But if in. you look in the back, you can see the sloping floor and the no roof and the stage and like the walls and the, everything's still original, I presume, from like the beams and walls and everything. The, the, all of the concrete walls and the metal roof joists are, are all original. Everything that we're standing on and above us, except for the roof joists, has been rebuilt. Got it. The only other original is, um, you can kind of see that square area over there, yeah. the, the white plastered area that's the original projection booth oh wow um where the, this is, this is the, a huge theater it, it is how a many people space. sat here um i think that originally um and this has been rebuilt in a different fashion it used to just have a balcony that kind of went up and then it went up to the projection booth there so i think originally it was rated for like 300 people yeah. perhaps yeah. um when it was built it wasn't built as a fancy theater it was yeah. a very basic from what i understand these original concrete floors is what what originally was put in it didn't ever have some kind of nice coating um originally it was just bench seating yeah. um so let me ask a difficult question when it was originally a segregated theater was it whites or blacks it was for the black community okay Got it. That's, um, I mean, and that's still something that permeates, you know, Mississippi to today. Yeah, right? no, it, it's definitely, it's a, we are in the historically black neighborhood, um, yeah. literally on the other side of the railroad tracks from the, the, the downtown area. Yeah. Um, most of the businesses in, on this 
particular stretch of the street, um, as I understand it, were the, the, the customers were the African-American community. Yeah. Um, most of the buildings and businesses on this section of the street were owned by um, Lebanese, Italian, Chinese okay. families. Um, and if you go around the corner in the New World District, it's been explained to me that some of the businesses on that street were more primarily black-owned businesses. Okay. But this is definitely the part of town where the black community was yeah. at. This is where the, the music and their shopping, they weren't allowed to be in the other part of that town. That is wild. Yeah. So do you, what's been the reception from the black community to this, to the New Rock City? Um, I think that with anybody, when you come to a town where you don't know anybody, you know, yeah. people, especially a small town are, you know, curious about what your intentions are, or what you're doing. And um, in the beginning, when I came here, most of the people in the community um, were very, um, you know, why would you move here? You know, yeah. everybody's trying to leave here. Um, so many people have had to leave even if they wanted to stay here because there's not a lot of economic opportunity. So right. the kids grow up and they get educated or they move away for work and then they don't come back. Um, so the population has continued to decline steadily. So it's still declining today? Yes. Yeah, I wow. think it has declined in the time that I have. And you been have, I mean, there has been an influx. I mean, I came here in the first place because of the history of the place and mm -hmm. like the blues, you know, uh, community. I mean, I wrote one of the better songs that I've ever written here, uh, sitting in the porch and shack up in because it's just kind of yeah. like, you it's know, inspiring. It yeah, yes. it's inspiring. It's everything. It's amazing. I mean, you can't, it's kind of like I was sitting in Muscle Shoals yesterday in the studio that, you know, the Stones recorded in Leonard Skinner. You can kind of feel the history, you know, and it's similar yeah. here. Yeah. Um, but it's wild. And actually, last night, I was having dinner with some folk, folks in Oxford, including our mutual friend Eric Deaton. Mm. And we were talking about how a lot of the musicians, like the blues musicians, uh, are beginning, like they're no longer in good health or they, they have passed. Yes. And then, you know, there's kind of questions as to what's going to happen with Clarksdale going forward and the music community here. What's your take on that? Um, it's definitely, uh, you know, uh, something that we think about and you're concerned about um, as far as the tradition of yeah. the music and how it's being passed on. Um, here in our community, the Delta Blues Museum has a great program. Um, yeah. Actually, teaching. Kingfish came out of there. Kingfish also. And um, he's he's here with uh, helping me today work, but um, Anthony Big A Sherrod. Yeah, is, Big A. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's Big oh, A. Oh, he's out here. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah, yeah. I've seen him, I've seen him <laughs> perform here at the stage downstairs. Yes, yes. No, we're, we're a very organic team here, and yeah. we all work hard during the day so that it can open yeah, up I would at, say at those night. Those are the two so. that I know who are younger blues musicians who yeah. are just killing it. Uh, who are, you know, I've seen I, Kingfish uh, a few times yeah. all over the country. Uh, so, so for us, you know, there's a certain amount of the, the tradition getting passed on. I know in the hill country there's, you know, you know, but it, but it's a small, it's yeah. a small thing. And there is concern for, for me here in, in this space. I definitely um, have tried to, you know, blues is my passion um, and I have particular um, types of blues that I like, you know, as an, is a whole blues, you know, there's a lot of niche um, yeah. types of blues within that category. So um, we um, have tried to have a, you know, we do blues, but we also will do Americana. Or we've had country shows. We've had, um, we host the Deep Blues Festival, yeah. which is focused more on an alternative heavy roots kind of blues um, that can lean towards punk and metal influence sometimes, okay. you know, with its well, roots. Well, metal is basically blues. It's yeah. just got a bunch of distortion on it. Yeah. And it's so, a little faster. But... Um, so we, we try to offer something different. If people, when people come to, to town for Duke Joint Festival, for example, there's, you know, different places that, that you know, our, our music tends to be, yeah. even though we have some of the great local um, and, you know, older bluesmen playing here, we yeah. also have some of the younger bands. Um, in the early days, for me, um, I, I couldn't get people to even come over here and walk down the street a okay. lot of times, um, let alone pay to get in. Yeah. So um, I had, you know, people that I had met through going to festivals or networking that would come to town and I would be like, well, I have this stage. I have this crazy stage yeah. and this theater with no roof. Well, it's amazing. And if yeah. you, if you want to play, we'll put up some Christmas lights and um, we have a little electricity. Awesome. And, and the bands, a number of the bands have, you know, worked with me over the years. I would give them a place to stay in the, in the warehouse across the street. We'd kind of flop in there and then they would play for tips and, you know, I'd try to feed them if I could. And as we progressed over the years, the same bands would come 
come back and I'd be able to pay them something. That's awesome. And um, we've grown grown together. Um, yeah. So basically, what this town needs is more people like you who are willing to invest in getting people coming back here. Um, there's a little bit of that. There, there are. There, you know, we we need. We would do great if we had some other industry also instead. In addition to just tourism, tourism, tourism can only go so far. This is, you know, an agricultural community, and so um, we we welcome our tourists and we want lots of tourists to come. We would love more people to move here, yeah. and um, we, you know, one of the opportunities about being in this community and one of the things that propelled me to sort of move forward on a spontaneous decision to buy a building is, you know, it's economically much more affordable to buy property here. Yeah. It's much more affordable to live here. Yeah. Um, I was living in a very nice neighborhood in, in Seattle and, you know, even if my house was paid off, my property taxes and yeah. the cost of living in the city, as much as I love my city, are, are much different than they are here. Yeah. Um, there's a certain amount of it this time, I think, in the South in general. A lot of people that left when they were younger are now in retirement age and they're coming home to either take care of their parents or they've retired and they're looking for, you know, a more affordable place. They're coming back home. Yeah. Um, Education is a problem here, so it's really hard. Even if we do have industry or somebody yeah. um, moving people here with families with children, it's the education system here it has a lot of work to do. Yeah, yeah. So it seems like uh, so. I've been. I've spent a little bit of time not only here, but I've been to Marks. I've been to you know places, and and it just it feels sometimes like man if you were born here like what's the way out like what's yeah. the you know it's like playing sec football and like you know other than that like i it, it, to me i was like man what there's got to be something that you can do to invest more and in, like you know giving people like a glimpse of what what's possible yeah right? it's 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 very difficult and it can be disheartening um we have some great programs i think you're gonna talk to callie later yeah um the, the grio program and spring yeah. initiative and different things that that are that are helping but yeah but it is it is a really hard you know cool. place to to sort of move beyond so in in whatever way we can and yeah. i don't have a solid plan but um just wanted to well it sounds like you're coming up with awesome ways to uh, <laughs> improvise plans as you go right yes we kind of make it up as we go <laughs> that's awesome so let's talk a little bit more about the building so uh historic there's a lot of uh, uh businesses that get started in historic buildings what are some of the specific i mean for somebody who doesn't know anything about you know putting a business in a historic building what is it like to walk in here and again you mentioned you know taking off you know having to take off the roof uh how do you deal with like safety how do you other specific licensing i mean we're talking about at the very least there's like lead paint issues but probably structural problems and all kinds of so how do you think about all that do you have to work with the city to preserve it, any aspect of it how does that work um yes those, those are all um big questions um it's one of the things about Clarksdale or Mississippi in the south, um, I wouldn't have been able to even consider taking on this project in, say, Seattle or a large city. Yeah. Um, the Mississippi State Building Codes were were um, not updated to, to modern code until, I think, like in the early 2000s. Okay. So a lot of the buildings, you know, just aren't up to code in general. And yeah. as you work on them, you know, we're working with the city to, to do things to proper international code now. So there, um, but it's a little more flexible here um, in some ways. It's just, um, you know, the buildings are just falling down and it's a small town. And if someone's yeah. willing to put the work in to clean it up and, and do something, that they're, they're willing to, to work with you. And, you know, so we can reach reach the uh, the positive goal together okay. um, and you would do it again if you, if you knowing all you know about how, like how hard it's been to bring this up to speed um <laughs> that's a tough one right? it's a, it's a tough one um for me my, you know my mom when she dropped me off to college she gave me a matchbook <laughs> and uh and it had a bunch of matches i'm like why is this and she said that because every time you just want to have like you know, light one match at a time if you're in a dark forest, because if you see the entire forest, then you're never going to get out. <laughs> yes, know? yes. Um, it, it would be hard. Um, I, I had some, I've had many, many people along this journey pushing, pulling, <laughs> and helping me get through it. Um, so even though it's, it's my building, I kind of, um, we have a local um, 
that used to own the Riverside Hotel, um, Frank Rack Ratcliffe, um, and he always used to say that he was just the caretaker of the Riverside Hotel, and I kind of like embraced that philosophy. It's like you know, I am the owner of the property, yeah. but I feel like I'm more the care caretaker, and whatever it takes to overall get that done. Um, well, I think that's true about life in general. Like nobody, I mean, I was having this conversation this morning on a, on a morning walk. Like nobody owns anything anyway. So just yes, it's it's just you know, it it's become my passion, and however, and there are moments when I wish I could give it back. <laughs> it's like somebody yeah. else come and take care of it. Um, you know, it's taken me through a very um, you know, a relationship that um, with my um, former husband that if it wasn't for his skills and his tremendous ability in design and construction, we wouldn't be where we were at at yeah. this point. We would still probably be under a tin, okay. <laughs> a tin roof in the corner. So, but you know, there's just so many people along the way that, that have helped just kind of piece by piece put things together. There's several people here working today that are just here volunteering and helping and they come through town awesome. and do what they can while they're I here. I feel like I need and to pick up a hammer or something. What am I <laughs> yes, doing? <I'm>, yes. <laughs> put me to work. Uh, yeah, you're, you're working now helping spread the word a little bit yeah. um, about our crazy project. So, but it's, it's a great communal thing to know that there are, you know, even in the early days, people would drop by and say, hey, you know, I had these chairs in a shed and they're not getting used and it seems like you could use some more chairs here. Cool. And, or, you know, just dropping things off or in the early days I, I didn't and I still don't have a lot of money to pay people. So it's been a lot of volunteer help and, you know, you know, if you want to volunteer while you're here, you know, we take a couple hours or, or whatever. And yeah. most of it's like sweaty, dirty work, <laughs> hauling yeah. dirt well, and sweaty, construction dirty work debris. Is good for the soul, so. um, but, you know, so many people have helped me with advertising, going to the small business angle of it, yeah. um, learning how to have a small business. This has grown into a business now. And I'm kind of at a, a crux point where it's it's grown beyond my being able to manage it as, as a hobby yeah. when I can, when I'm not working. We actually have a team of people that without them I wouldn't be able to continue going forward that makes um, sense. you know as we rent it out more I have somebody has to be able to answer the phone and show the space when I'm not here right and, um, we have volunteer bartenders that you know come and and, and yeah. work to so that we can open a lot of the musicians and the artists you know come and play for free or play for tips and Megan for us. Who introduced us she's one of the volunteers yes bartenders. yes Megan's uh, she's uh, she's our um, Main um, adver advertising, Mike? Mike? Uh, Megan Mike, yes. Mike, yeah, so she, um, she deserves the credit for putting oh, this Oh, yes, very much, Megan. Um, Lena Von Makui and John Magnuson are all my main team right now between us. Yeah. We get things kind of are able to say right now, yes, we can take a booking for a private event for you in May and not my having to say, well, I'm going to be out to see then, so I can't, you know, do yeah. a, a booking. So, uh, you know, as we move forward and we have more electricity and more infrastructure. When I first opened, yeah. we didn't have bathrooms. We didn't have any electricity. Yeah. And so that... And, and I mean, this feels like this is never going to be done. Like there's always like more, not in a bad way. Like no, in, I know, in a way I know. that there's always new, cool, creative ways in which you can add things to the space, do things to the space. I mean, what else have you done? Like art shows and stuff like that. We've done several art openings. We've done a couple of spoken word events. Yeah. Um, we have a, a series. It's in hiatus right now, but um, the mosquito was our spoken word event. Yeah. Kind of a takeoff to the cool. moth. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, we do different things. Um, I'd love to continue. We're working on a community garden outside next door. You yeah. know. Know, just a holistic holistically we want it to be a, a center of, of good things yeah you know? the, the garden thing is actually really cool I spoke to a, an urban farmer in uh, in one of like the one of the uh, lower income neighborhoods of Springfield Missouri and she's doing amazing stuff with basically running a farm in an urban area and getting people like more involved and people who care and they're doing a CSA which is community supported agriculture yeah a lot of really cool stuff with that actually there's a couple plots here where you could like there's start. there's lots of land downtown because there's so many buildings have fallen down and it, it's you know again that's a whole other aspect of you know yeah. farming and we had some chickens and yeah. the, you know didn't end <laughs> it ended not so well but uh, yeah, we're growing our herbs now yeah. but um so yeah you know like this is i've chosen to make this you know my home and i'm planting trees and settling in both literally and figuratively <laughs> yes yes that is awesome <laughs> so. metaphoric metaphor planting metaphoric <laughs> trees 
Yeah, there's a guitar builder that's well, very well known, Bob Taylor, that mm -hmm. uh, is uh, you know from Taylor Guitars, and they're now probably one, one of the biggest uh, manufacturers of guitars. And he talks about uh, th they're doing uh, reforestation things, where they're planting trees for the woods that they use for their guitars, even mm -hmm. though they know that he won't. Like they won't him be in his lifetime. They won't lifetime, be alive yeah. that, to see the results of those, but they feel like that's a good oh definitely uh, yes. stewardship thing to 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 carry forward. That's really cool. Um, can you think, I mean, I'm sure this has happened a few <laughs> times and you kind of alluded to some of it, but can you think of a specific story at a time when things went really wrong and then what did you do about it? Um, well, one of the big ones that comes to mind um, in 2009, 2010, actually I think um, when we first started we do have a stage but once we pulled all of the roofing down yeah um, there was no roof and so if it rained it rained and uh, there's a big drain in the middle of the whole middle of the floor yeah which is where all the rainwater goes so it's mostly okay but um, as far as equipment and a band being there um, and it was always you know very risky to commit to an event that was like particularly important because if it rained, how do we handle that? And we uh, had done a few things and it had gone okay. And so the Sunflower River um, yeah. Blues and Gospel Festival asked us to, if we would be a stage. And we were so excited and thrilled to participate. And they had the sound equipment set up and we had set up, you know, 200 chairs and you could just see the huge storm clouds rolling oh. in and, um, it hadn't rained on that day in like 20 years or oh, something Jesus. and just absolute torrential downpour and oh, it's put you need, so you're much heart-wrenching like, uh, effort field, you know? yes um so, so that was you know oh. really you know so we'd worked so hard to be able to do that and then it just rained did you have to cancel it oh yeah they uh they, they started packing up the sound equipment and found an alternate location and it rained the entire day it was it was a rough for the whole festival that year but you know that was like you know it's, I, I have to do something to get a roof over the stage if nothing else yeah. and so that um we um got the roof up in 2010 is it possible to do a retractable roof or something like that or like um, a tarp not roof? not on our budget okay. but um the design as we rebuilt the roof the design was that this open area that we left open um, could have a tarping system to yeah. pull over. Um, and that may or may not happen someday. Right now there's bird netting out there. We yeah. developed a bird problem when we started getting some roof back. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it's possible. You know, it would be nice to be able to know that if we had a, a very big, yeah. important event that we could, if nothing else, pull the tarp over yeah. for that. So. And you're getting more and more festivals coming through town, right? Um, yeah, Clarksdale Festival City USA. Yeah. We so are, you have, you um, have I, the ones that I know of, the Juke Joint Festival, you just mentioned the Sunflower one, and there's the Deep Blues Festival. There's the Goat one. Goat Festival in June. Yeah. There's um, the Mississippi Saxophone Festival in yeah. May. Yeah. Um, we have some smaller ones that have been going on for many years. Um, okay. The Caravan Festival and Hambone Festival. And um, we've got the Deep Blues Festival in October. They do a film festival in January, the Tennessee Williams Festival in October. Jesus. Um, and there's some other small ones too. And oh, we just uh, we just took a reservation for, um, it's not really public yet, but the uh, Cigar Box Guitar Builders oh, Association. Oh yeah, I built Cigar Box Guitar. Is yes, that James Spiel and in, all those guys? Um, It's going to be in late September and um, I was talking to a gentleman from Seattle and Florida about it, and I'm not sure. Yeah. I can't remember the names of. Well, there's Ben it. Baker from CB Giddy that's involved with that, and then oh, he know he's the guy that sells the supplies. There's another guy that does it. They did yeah. it in New Orleans, I think, one year. Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah. I'm not so yeah. familiar okay. with them. So yeah, you know, we're 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 and we definitely are trying to market ourselves. So Is that if that you want to come here and have your festival and do your thing yeah. or bring a group of people. And, you know, it's it's very affordable to book a band like Big A and his band. You yeah. can book them and have your own and awesome. party and come down. So <laughs> something doesn't add up for me because there's not a ton of lodging. So I've stayed at the Shack Cup Inn when Guy's going to be on the show, but in, there's not a lot of hotels. So there, where, where do people there stay? Are, there are hotels. That is one problem for us during Jute Joint Festival. Um, the rooms get booked out a year in advance. But there is a, um, a growing thing. We have a lot of boutique hotels downtown, okay. Okay. and I use boutique lightly. They're, they're great places, but they're, they're very unique, artsy yeah, lodgings. Yeah, boutique's great. It's not bad. Um, so there are a number of those that are you, know, you don't necessarily see them driving down the highway. Um, there's some plans for a couple more that are 
in the works. So there there are more places okay. that then meets the eye about to stay. But I would do not know that. Yeah. But well, that um, makes sense. And in fact, that's uh, John Magnuson, one of our team members. Yeah. Um, um, he has his house, um, Chateau de Brie, and then he manages some other um, properties, the Hooker Hotel, yeah. Delta Dig, Squeeze Box. Um, the Hooker Hotel. That's across the street from the, the museum, the second, yeah. the, the Yeah, Rock there's, there's actually three a individual hand bar, right? a hand in the museum. Um, hotel rooms there. We've yeah. got the High Cotton Rooms, the Haberdashery, yeah. um, the Five and Dime, um, Blue Town Flat. There's a whole number of them that are more like apartments. That is awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. What's what would you say? Um, I mean, this is commendable labor of love that you're doing, and and uh, you know, I, it's cool to see that it's starting to make business sense and you continue to grow. What would you say is the number one business lesson that you would have, share with small business owners or people who are thinking about embarking in a small business venture? Um, well, I'm not the most successful business owner. So. I think we're sitting in an amazing place, which makes it's you a an success. amazing. It's an amazing, amazing space. We have a great building. Um, it's not supporting itself just yet. Um, for me, it's really important, and you know, I know these are things that you know are always the hardest for most people. But you know, the financial aspect, the books, yeah. um, the paperwork, and the bookkeeping, and the. You know, everyone says, you know, you need to have a business plan before you start a business. And to this day, I still don't have a business plan. Yeah. Um, we, we've tried to make some proactive looking at our numbers. We, you know, we, we, we knew when we started this project um, that it, at the current economic climate, that it's not really possible for this building to support me. Yeah. I, I know that it cannot support the lifestyle that I'm accustomed to yeah. and itself. Um, I know that, you know, at best it might break even. So when we um, committed to investing and taking the loans out to do the construction, um, it was based on the fact that we were living here and this was going to be my mortgage and this is going to be the finished apartment that's not finished yet. Oh, this is going to be an apartment? Yeah. That, wow. that was the initial plan, that, that this space and then there's another level up here so that this would be an apartment and this would justify... I see it now. I hadn't seen it before, but um, I see it now. Wow. The, the, the construction loan so that um, if we couldn't ever grow the business into something at least you know we had a place to live that was that was our kind of business model yeah. business plan um well you know what the definition of a business plan is right a flexible right it's a guideline <laughs> no, the, no the definition of a business plan is the one thing that is absolutely guaranteed not to happen yes <laughs> yeah i can see that so uh yeah cool. so you know but managing that looking at yeah. you know what does it really cost to run the business yeah. what are my expenses and sort of looking at that and you know paying attention to it you know that's amazing what where do you i mean we've kind of touched on this and we've touched on on the city but tell me about where do you see this going in the next 10 years and where do you see clarksville in the next 10 years what's the uh, what's the way forward mm, that's a very big and complicated question and yeah. um you can't you know take away right now the the, the state of our nation as a whole and yeah. our political climate um, the Delta has is one of the poorest regions in the poorest state in our country. Yeah. Um, so even in the economic recession of 2008, it, it almost didn't feel like you felt it here because you were we were already down. so far down at the bottom of the economic spectrum yeah. um, that um, it wasn't as dramatic here. But... Um, you know, there are things people in the community are doing different things. We're, we're, we're trying, you know, consciously as a community, trying to find answers to some of those questions. Um, but there are big and systemic issues. Um, we're in the heart of the Delta, you know, the, the last place to do away with Jim Crow, and they didn't do away with it voluntarily. Um, so When was that? Um, I know, and this is one of my experiences coming here as someone from not from this community and from this part of the world. Um, I sort of grew up thinking the civil rights movement was something that was like a long time ago in history and yeah. in the past. And when I first started coming here in 2005 and such, meeting people that were you know that that was that went to segregated schools and that you know remember it wasn't until the 70s that the schools here i believe were fully um integrated again yeah. and you know most of the schools the public schools became integrated and and the white people all went to private schools that were formed as a response to forced integration so um it's 
even you know even in recent history there are still yeah. places that have segregated proms in this state and here in Mississippi yes that um, is wild there's a well known documentary that Morgan Freeman was involved with um, in a community not far from here so it's um, in some ways it's like a couple of decades behind At least. here and you look you live it in a daily basis yeah. it's just so different I mean, i've here. lived it in like one week chunks when i come to mississippi mm -hmm. and i feel it i feel it. it's like yeah 40 50 years of like you know of of you know coming from california kind of having lived in you know texas california it's and and coming from a different country i grew up in chile and, and i you know lived in germany growing up it it's just different it's different it, and, it is different and it's you know, as an outsider, you know, I, you know, I was like, wow, we'd like to see things better for the people that live here. You don't, but I also don't want to like come in and, you know, change your way of life or, you know, it's just how do you, um, I, I have fears about, you know, gentrification and, you know, how, how does my presence impact this neighborhood? Um, I, I like to think that I have helped um, bring a little bit of attention to the community yeah. and my being really active on working on my property um, leads to other people, you know, care. trying to care and do the same thing. And it, right. it brings more people here. And um, when I like earlier, I mentioned when I first started coming, people were always like, why are you coming here? I'm trying to leave here. Why are, why would you move here? And um, all of the people like me and all the tourists that come from around the world have given people in the community a, a certain amount of a sense of pride in their community. They um, some because of the, people see themselves this, as desirable. Yeah, as, yeah, and you know they they get to feel special. And um, when we've had the um, the festivals, people in the neighborhood would come out that maybe hadn't before. And you know, oh, it's festival time, and yeah, we're cleaning up the neighborhood because we know, you know, it's time it's to awesome. make things look good for the the tourists that are coming, and yeah. how much that festival has grown and brought people that continue to come back. That is awesome. Um, so yeah, very cool. Is there anything else that you want people to know about your business? Do you have a website working? Do you have an Instagram account? How how can people find you? Um, we we have a web page, newroxy.com, okay. and we have Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Um, you can find us at New Roxy on the Facebook Instagram thing, and that's about as far as we uh, venture out into the social media world. We have a Twitter, but um, I have a hard time with it, so we're not real no active problem. there. No problem. Well. Thank you very, very much, uh, Robin, for sitting down with me today and sharing this amazing, amazing story. I really uh, wholeheartedly wish uh, wish you the best of luck with uh, with everything you're doing. I think you're doing important work. And uh, yeah, congratulations on your success so far, and I wish you much more. Great. Thank you so much, and um, enjoy the rest of your journey. It sounds like an amazing road trip. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for listening to Small Business War Stories. If you enjoy the show... Share it with a friend, or you can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our blog at blog.proven.com. If you have an idea for us, we'd love to hear it. Please email us at podcast at proven.com. See you next time. Small Business War Stories Small businesses are the soul of America. And this is where they tell their stories. I am your host, Pablo Fuentes.